Hey, what up guys, my name is HB and today I'm here to show you how I created my first track, Age of Aquarius. So let's go. So I guess I should explain how this track came about. I was initially inspired by an Armin Van Buren and w, w track. And what I really liked about the track, they had this really cool pluck sound. So I decided to make my own version of it. And after messing around with it a little bit and putting all the delays and effects on it, it kind of gave me this underwater type of feeling. So that's how the track got the theme of water slash under, underwater. And that's really the basic idea. I just kept, you know, building upon that until I got the track that we have here. So that's really uh, the, the idea behind the track. And this is a really easy sound to make. Basically what it is is just a saw wave that's been filtered and the filter is being modulated by LFO1 to give it that plucky sound. And that's basically it. I just added a little bit of a multiband compression to the sound, but nothing crazy really. It's just a very simple sound. Now underneath the pluck sound, we have this pad that is playing. And if I'm not mistaken, it's a preset from one of the uh, the Nexus libraries. It's kind of a whale sound type of pad, which helps give it that underwater feel to it. There's really nothing crazy going on here. I guess the one tip that I would share about using pads is always keep in mind that the sound is going to fade in and fade out. So that can cause a lot of issues with the timing of the uh, of the chords. So what I always do is I bounce the pad into audio and then I move it a little bit to the left so I can counter the slow fade in and then I just get rid of this and that way I don't have any syncing issues with the rest of the instruments that are playing in the track. But yeah, that's just a, a small tip. Keep in mind uh, whenever you're using pads because of the, uh, the attack and release settings that they have, you might need to adjust it to keep everything in sync. You don't want it to clash because by the time the chord goes to the uh, the second chord, it's going to take a, a while for the pad to kick in into that second chord while the rest of the instruments are already playing on that second chord. That's just a, a thing to keep in mind whenever you're using pads and sounds like this. So another element in the break is this really cool vocal that I have here. It kind of follows some of the notes of the chords, but really what makes it interesting is this bit crusher effect, this redox effect that I have on it. As you can see, it's being automated. Let me just play how this sounds without any of this. And if you're wondering where, where I got this vocal from, it's a contact library. It's called Shivani's Elf or something like that. I have it on the screen right now so you can see what it is. I, I really like that library and I use it a lot. You know, in the future, you, you'll see that I almost have it in every track that, that I'm making. So even though this is not a, a sponsored video, but uh, I, I totally recommend using it. Uh, I think it's a really cool library. But anyway, going back here. So I have the bit crusher effect here, the redox. This is the uh, Ableton stock one. The reason why I'm using it in an effect track and I have like one channel that has nothing and then another track that has the bit crusher on it is because there is no dry wet knob. So uh, I don't want the uh, the effect to be so overbearing. I just want a little bit of it. So that's why I duplicated the channels and I have the effect here at minus 12 dB. So I just want a little bit of it. I, I don't want it to take over the whole sound and bit crush it. And then what I also have, I have have Glitch 2. This is a really cool plugin. Uh, I also use it a lot. This is also not sponsored, but I recommend you guys get it. I think it's a, a really good plugin to have. And I'm using the lo-fi effect from it. And as you can see, if I go here, those are the settings for it. It's really, it's just emphasizing the bit crush effect and kind of distorting it even more. And we get this really cool texture. I'm going to play it for you guys so you can hear what I'm talking about.
This is without the glitch. So you can see how it emphasized it and distorted it even more. But now if I kept it like this, this would be too much and it would clash with the rest of the instruments that we have in the break. As you can hear, it's not very pleasing to the ear. So what I end up doing is just filtering it using a high cut. And I just automated that to kind of emulate this glitch effect. And I'm just going to play it for you solo. It's a technique that I'm using more and more in different tracks. We have a bunch of bass layers going on in the break, and I'm going to address them here now one by one. So starting off with the bass shot. So this is kind of a acid type of bass shot. We have some sort of a square wave. I'm using the, uh, the basic shapes. This is shape number six. And here we have a square wave and they're both being filtered by a band pass. As you can see with a very high resonance, that's what gives it that peak that you can hear. And if you saturate it and also, uh, once again, multi-band compression, if you do that, you're going to get a very acidy type of sound. If I take the filter off, you can hear how we're losing that edge. So this is really the secret to this sound is just using some sort of a basic sound wave and then just filtering it with a high resonance. You can use a band pass. You can use also a uh, low pass. But really what's going to make this sound is the resonance combined with the distortion. And that's really it for this sound. I just added a, a bunch of reverb to it to give it that long tail. But really underneath it all, the main bass is the Hoover bass that we have here. And once again, there's not a lot of crazy sound design going on here, but there is one trick actually that is very important. And that trick is, as you can see, we have two oscillators. So oscillator A is just a super saw and the, the octave, just keep in mind, this is uh, an octave up from oscillator B. So this is how oscillator A sounds. Just a filtered super saw, the, the filtration coming from uh, Pro Q2. I cut all of the uh, high frequencies above uh, 250 ish. But now the really cool tip is here with oscillator B. So oscillator A is playing at a higher octave, and then we have B at a lower octave. But if we just use a regular saw for oscillator B, uh, we're going to have a problem. And the problem is because of the 16 voices that we're using, we're going to have a bunch of voices that are competing on the fundamental of the sound that can cause some phasing issues. Just use a regular saw wave. But then if you click here to the uh, uh, wave editor and just take, just remove the fundamental of it, just drag it down like so. And by that, we're keeping all of the other instances of the wave, but we're removing just the, the really low fundamental. And this is how it sounds. So as you can hear, it still sounds an octave lower than oscillator A, but we don't have all of that phasing issues in the, the low fundamental. So yeah, that's really my tip for those types of sounds because you don't really need the, the low fundamental during the break anyway. If this was to play on the drop, I would have a separate instance of Serum. I would have just a clean sine wave playing at the low fundamental to replace the other fundamental that we lost. So that's how I approach these types of sounds. Now, as we move to the other section of the breakdown, we have more sounds that are being added and we have this bass line that's being added. Really, the, the secret to the sound comes from the MIDI. We have the bass notes of the chords and above it, we have all of those notes that are just an octave higher, but because this sound is in legato mode, it kind of skips between the notes and not playing the, 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 those notes at the same time. 
So that what gives it this really cool effect of this jumping up and down. Now, I didn't use Legato. I could have used it. Uh, I was cool with just putting it in mono. So it kind of instantly glides between the notes. But if you want to exaggerate it, I guess you can use the Legato here and then just play around with the Portamento. Besides that, once again, it's a really simple sound. It's just a super saw, as we saw in the uh, the previous bass. Uh, I have one at 16, 16 voices. Once again, using the, the trick of, of removing the, the low fundamental. And I have another one, which is just one voice, also removing the low fundamental. They're both being filtered here by a low pass. I do, however, have another EQ that's filtering it with a very high Q, uh, very high resonance, and goes from really low, really closed around like the, the, the 1K area, and it's opening up until the 5K area, just to give it that extra movement and the feel that it's kind of opening up so it can lead us to the next section over here. We have this sign pad that's being added in this section as well. And once again, super basic sound is just a sine wave with 16 voices, a little bit of detunement, and that's it really. There, there's nothing more to this sound. But here we have a bunch of live instruments that are being added. We have this pad strings. It's just one note that's being held down. It's actually the F sharp, which is the key of the track. By the way, this string layer is really good at adding tension to a track. This is a really common trick. And this is something that I'm using in every track. By the way, I'm using the strings from Nexus, I believe. Uh, a lot of stuff are here from Nexus. Some stuff are from contact libraries, as I think this is a contact library. We have this man choir layer. They're kind of playing a lower octave of the uh, the distortion vocal that I showed you guys earlier. Now transitioning from the first part of the break to the second part of the break, we have this bass growl that kind of helps us transition and mark that this is a new part of the break. And this sound is kind of complicated. We have a saw wave, but as you can see, I'm also using that trick of removing the, the lower fundamental. Once again, the reason for it is that we don't want that frequency in the break. We want to introduce that frequency in the drop. So there's a clear di di distinction between the, the break and the drop. That way the, the drop hits harder. It's just a, a, a quick tip right there or information to to keep in mind so i have a macro here that's being assigned to the filter effect over here and this is on format one so it gives it a little bit of movement uh, on the cutoff just gives it that talking vowel type of sound that's really what it's doing i don't have the mix on 100 i have it on 90 percent because i want to also preserve a little bit of, of the sound underneath if you're using heavy filters like that it, when when you put them on 100%, you tend to lose a lot of information. So in order to not lose all of that information, you can just lower the mix. I chose 90%. Besides that, I had the macro also controlling the phaser, but I guess I ended up not using it. Really, there's nothing else more to it, just a delay effect and just a heavy distortion that distorts all of this. There is post-processing, however. I have here Pro-Q just boosting a little bit of the, uh, the mid lows over here and cutting off those frequencies over here getting rid of all of those unwanted frequencies then i'm using an ott i have it at 30 percent then i have this really cool flanger plugin it's a free plugin so you can download it uh, I, I might put a link in the description as you can see i'm using the uh, the light flange settings but i'm also tweaking it a little bit just playing around with the rate and also the feedback i believe and that gives it a, a really like really cool extra movement to it let, let me see if i can uh, bypass this and let you hear with and without. 
It gives it a little bit of more stereo information, but also it kind of makes it a little bit more dirty and rough. And I think it's because when you add more stereo information, it, it might cause some phase issues that kind of, in this case, they sound good, but you also have to be careful with it. But I think that's what's going on here. So this is more of a complicated type of sound. It's not you know, on the level of AU5 or Skrillex or anything like that. But I guess the takeaway from, from this type of sound would be to just use filtration, distortion, and the cycle repeats itself until you find something that is really cool sounding to you. But now we move on to the new section of the break and we have even more sounds that are being introduced and added to the mix. Like this ARP bass that we have here. And as you can see, I really hate repeating myself, but it's a uh, it's it's true. It's a very basic sound. Once again, it's just a saw wave, and another saw wave, four voices, five voices, a little bit of the two mint and low pass. Nothing special, really. LFO one just gives it that that is modulating the, the filter, just giving it that initial pluck and an attack to the sound, but really very basic. And this is a new layer that's being added here. We have basically just a guitar distortion sound just playing like a power chord that's being opened up by, by an EQ. And this is how it sounds. Now, this is also coming from a contact library. I'm really not sure which sound that I use or what library this came from. Th this is an old uh, project, by the way. So that's why uh, a lot of the stuff, I have no idea how I got these sounds. So the, the, the sound itself al already came with distortion, apparently, but I just added a little bit of erosion. This is a default or a stock Ableton plugin uh, just to give it a little bit of a little bit more edge. So as you can hear, the erosion is giving us uh, a little bit more of high frequencies. And we have this auto pan that gives it a little bit of extra movement within the stereo field. This is really cool, not also to give it extra movement, but also to free up space within the mix. Because you got to keep in mind, when you add layers upon layers upon layers, they're not all going to have room to sit and coexist. So you have to be really creative how you make space for certain layers. And, you know, you need to know, like, where to position certain, certain layers. This is not only for cool movement, but it's also serving, like, a practical function here within the mix to, uh, uh, clear and make some room for the other bass sounds that we just heard like the legato bass and the arp bass and on top of that it's being automated as i mentioned just having the low pass kind of starting from really low going to really high just opening the sound giving it that extra movement now to emphasize those bass sounds that we have we have a layers of live instruments we have this string Those are the type of layers that you don't really hear within the mix, but they just make everything sound fuller. Really, if you take those out, you might not notice it, but it, 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 it makes a difference. It just makes everything sound fuller. And now we have this layer. It's the same note pattern of the, the bass, just an octave higher, just to make it sound more rich and more full. It might be a contact library or Nexus. I, I don't even know. As I said, this is an old project, so I don't really remember what I used, but it's 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 very, very basic. You can get those type of, of sounds anywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Nexus or contact or even the default stuff that you get with uh, with Ableton. We have a really cool call and response type of situation going on here. And it's between the piano, which is a regular piano. I believe this is from Nexus, just a regular piano sound with a, a, a shit ton of reverb on it. So that was the call and this saw wave is the response. 
And as you can see, it's just a regular sound wave, one voice. What makes it sound maybe a little bit more uh, unique, I guess, is a little bit of phaser that I have uh, here and also multiband compression. And also I have LFO one modulating the uh, the master tunement, just give it a little bit of, uh, of extra movement to the pitch. And right before we're about to move on to the final part of the break, we have this sound that helps us introduce the next part, which is the super saw. And this is how it sounds. So you really have this cool intro to it. It's just one chord that's being held down. And then you have this EQ filtering it with a high resonance, giving it the really cool filter type of sound. But really for the, the sound itself, it's just a super saw with 16 voices, different detunements slightly. And now that we move to the next part, the, the final part of the break, where we have the super saws playing in the background, we have also the kick drum. We have this sound that is replacing the piano sound that we had in the previous part. So it's the same uh, melody, the same notes, the same call and response. But this time we have this sound here replacing the piano. I don't even know how to describe it. I guess it, it kind of sounds like an electric guitar, uh, like a distorted electric guitar type of sound. It's a squarish wavetable. As you can see here, it's from the basic shapes position at six. If you guys remember, we had the bass shot earlier. It's the same type of deal, same type of situation. We have that uh, wave shape that's being filtered. This time we have a, a low pass with high resonance. Once again, the high resonance is the key and it's been distorted heavily. Also multi band compression and we have LFO one just adding additional movement modulating the master tunement the overall pitch of the sound and we also have LFO two that is modulating the uh, uh, I don't even know what that means to be honest the PWM oh no if you open it up it kind of makes it go like this I know it's not a professional term but hey sometimes you don't need to know everything but uh, anyway, we just have LFO2 modulating it a little bit, giving it extra movement. Now, I added this dub delay, kind of a dub station delay. I believe this is a free plugin, so maybe I'll put the link in the description. Really cool plugin. Uh, I recommend using it. The difference between these types of delays and just regular delays is the extra filtration that they have on top of it so the longer that the delay goes the more it's being filtered but it's been filtered in a way where it has like really high resonance and it just makes it sound so cool i don't have other definition for it it just sounds cool you hear it a lot in reggae and dance hall and i just really like using these types of delays but however you do need to be careful with these delays because you can easily destroy your monitors and your ears if you're messing around with the uh, the resonance and the feedback and how long the uh, the delay is lasting for so be careful not to uh, uh push it to the extreme because it's a very extreme effect Act to begin with. Now, before we move up to the next part, which is the buildup, I want to show you just a little bit of the drums that we have here, some of the samples and the sound effects that we're using. So this is nothing special, but here are the impact samples that we have here. I'm just cutting the samples and making them fit together. I really like how the these two samples uh, uh, are working together. And here I'm just cutting a lot of the, the high frequencies on this sample. And also this is uh, uh, the case with this one, just taking down this area of frequencies. But now if we move forward a little bit to this section right here, Now I call them transformers types of sounds, all of those really glitchy textures that I'm using here. I'm just using different samples and kind of mishmashing them together to create this unique sound that fits with the track. So we have this airlock type of sound right here. And once again, nothing crazy with, with the uh, the processing of it. Uh, I don't know why I have this saturator on. It's not doing anything. Uh, we can get rid of it. And then I have this layer. 
and then this layer. And together they sound like this. This is something that a lot of sound designers and, and movies and video games are using. They're not just using one layer or one sample. They're always layering samples to make it sound more interesting, more unique, more full to get a better effect overall. So if you're not layering your samples, you should start. I'm also using those glitch textures over here in this part just to transition between the sections. Here I'm using this glitch and this sample right here to kind of ease between everything. I forgot to mention this rumble sample that I have here. The reason for using this sample is just to add a little bit more texture in the, the lower frequencies in this section right here where the bass growl is playing. Just to sell that impact a little bit more. Now I'm also using sound effects, water sounds, but I think that the most important thing about using sound effects in, in tracks is to not overdo it. And uh, I'm, I'm saying this because when I was starting out, I, I really liked the idea of adding sound effects to tracks, but I just got carried away with it to the point where I would have too many sound effects and they were hella loud in the mix to the point where they were the main thing that you heard w while the track was playing. And I think it's something Thing that a lot of a, a lot of you know beginners are tending to use sometimes as a crotch or sometimes you just they get carried away and they, they lose sight of what's really important within the track and those are the main musical elements really the sound effects are supposed to be used as a layer underneath to kind of support the the whole musical idea so just keep in mind you know when you're using sound effects don't don't get carried away and try to use them sparingly and lower the volume volume on, on the samples unless it's for a really brief moment within the track where you gotta you know you have a really cool idea to use a sound effect to transition between two parts So as you can hear, it starts from a underwater type of sound. It sounds very muffled. And then you have this water transition, this water flush sample. And then the other water sample changes into a more clear and clean water sound as if you were hearing it not from underneath but above the water surface so it's it's almost like you're starting underwater and then you go in outside of the water over here and then on top of it i have this crowd sample just to add additional hype to this area But as you can see, I have the volume very low on these layers and you probably won't even notice them when you're hearing the full track. Very brief, I just want to say that I have also this ride sample over here in this section. The reason I use this ride is just to indicate the, the rhythm of the track just a little bit. But as you can see, it's really low on volume. So it's not really supposed to be there to drive the, the rhythm, but it's it's supposed to be there almost like making you subconsciously think about the rhythm of the track. Okay, so now we arrive to the buildup section. And this is a snare that I made from scratch. As you can see here, I have a snare group. You have two layers, the main snare body, and then you have the snare white noise layer. And the first one I'm making through uh, this plugin called Kick2. I highly recommend you get this plugin. Really what this is, is just a sine wave that's being pitched from very high to really low, really fast. And this is how it sounds. Real quick, I'm just going to show you the amp settings that I have here so you can copy the same shape. You can also see the distortions that I'm using. So if you want to copy the settings, you can take a look. But that's the body layer of the snare. And then we have the white noise layer, which is just a white noise. I have here operator, which is the stock synthesizer from Ableton. In order to make it sound like a 
snare hit, I have this EQ that is filtering the highs. So we have initially we have a bunch of highs and then it filters them out as it goes along. Not only that, I'm also automating the volume and together they sound like this. We have OTT, just 20%, and we have also the saturator just clipping the sound even more to make it sound more beefy. And also we have Valhalla Room just adding a little bit of reverb to the sound. Now, after that, I just recorded what I made and I just laid down the pattern. But I guess one thing to note is that I have a volume automation and I'm just lowering the volume by 6 dB when it reaches the end of the buildup. The reason for that is to better transition to the drop, just dropping the overall volume of everything. And I have this volume automation on a bunch of other elements within the buildup, just so the drop has more impact. But that's it for the snare. Now, another new element that's been introduced is the leads, but I think I will leave that for part two and show you how I made those leads. But another subtle layer that I have here is I have these toms playing in the buildup and they're very low in volume, so you can barely hear them. But also I'm spreading them within the stereo space using this delay with the wet at 100%. I'm basically delaying the left channel from the right channel by 14.6 milliseconds. There's a reason why I chose this specific number and I will get to that more in part two. So it's really, uh, it's really worth sticking around for part two. But this is how the toms are sounding. So if I'm not mistaken, one sample is at C sharp and the other sample is at F sharp. So it's going from high to low. And other than that, you know, we have distortion, we have EQ shaping the sound. I'm also using a utility to make the uh, the, the sound 100% mono. I guess I could have just pressed this button instead of lowering the mid side into the mid. A lot of times you would see me use this whenever I'm using samples. A lot of times you can find samples where you like the mono information of them but the, something about the stereo information is a little bit wonky or vice versa if you like the, the the stereo information and you don't like the mono information so or maybe you just want to lower a little bit of the stereo volume or increase the stereo volume so that's why i would use a utility because not every time you can find a perfect samples unfortunately and before we wrap this up real quick, I guess I'm going to talk about this very small part that transitions between the buildup and the drop. And really, there's not a lot of stuff going on here. It's just this distortion vocal that we already talked about, and it's doing this. So I'm basically just automating the on and off, making it this really stuttery effect. Uh, besides that, I'm using these drum samples over here. And as you can see, I did a little bit of editing. Sometimes when you're using uh, when you're using samples, they don't always fit to the BPM of the track or the 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 pitch of the track. So you have to do a bunch of editing. I think this one, as you can see, it was 126 BPM, which I'm working on 128. So I had to manually cut, find the transient and paste it over here and do the same over here and kind of crossfade between everything. Also, when the reason why I'm doing it this way, instead of trying to warp the sound and making it fit to the BPM through the warp is because when you warp a sound, usually you get a bunch of artifacts that, that I don't like. So that's why I always tend to just disable the warp and have the sample play at its original tempo and pitch and then doing it this way instead of trying to warp the sound. So that's just a quick tip right there. Uh, I think what I'm doing here is also adjusting the volume at the end here on the last shot as you can see here the the, the very end here but what, what i did is just splice 
slice this into two and then I have one sample at minus six and the other one is at minus four and I use a really large fade between them because this part right here was really loud so that was a way for me to lower the volume you can do the same with just uh, uh automating the volume really but I just wanted to do it that way I think there's a benefit to doing it this way because that way you can see through the waveform the you're doing a good job of leveling it out because right now it looks even as you can see right there it had a little bit of a volume increase towards the end that i didn't really like but that's it basically there's not a lot of crazy processing going on just an eq getting rid of a little bit of the highs here same i'm using ott just to uh, make it sound a little bit better and that's it hopefully this was helpful for you guys let me know in the comments down below just a reminder i'm gonna be linking all of the links to the free plugins that i was talking about in the description but also i'm gonna be giving away all of the presets that i was mentioning during the breakdown to all of the serum layers and the kick two layer so you can find those at the description you can download it for free and if you have more questions something that you didn't understand maybe i didn't go into enough details about you can always join me live when i'm streaming on twitch i stream every sunday around 6 p.m gmt plus two time so feel free to join me there my username is dhb that's t-h-e-e -E underscore h-b and also stay tuned for part two i'm going to be showing you a lot more stuff i'm going to show you how i mix and master how i created the kick and bass from scratch no samples were, were used so i guess i'll see you guys in part two okay bye